You may not have heard of Vollenbeck, but it's an extraordinary startup, bringing us clothing from the future and from the extreme past. From being fated as Time Magazine's best inventions of the year twice, to making the world's first graphene clothing, its founders, Steve and Nick Tidball, are amongst the most creative entrepreneurs we've ever met. If you're interested in the mindset of an entrepreneur, sit back and enjoy this episode. Welcome to The Evolving Leader. I'm Scott Allender, co-host of the show, along with the most well-proportioned man in podcasting, John Gomes. Oh, thanks, Scott. How are you feeling? I'm feeling uh, curious and filled with anticipation because we are about to be transported into the future in our show today, or perhaps a better way to say it is the future is here, and I think we are all about to see why. How are you feeling, John? Well, in common with a lot of the guests that we've had, our, our, our guest today is incredibly busy, and you'll, you'll understand why, because he's trying to change the world, or trying to change the future, let's put it that way. And so I'm, I'm incredibly um, uh, excited to have Steve here, because I get massively inspired by every time I meet him. I learn something new every time, and he, he makes me laugh as well, which is, which is great. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, John. I'm blushing. <laughs> here, here in my house. <laughs> so, Steve, before we get stuck in, give us the the Volenbeck pitch uh, for for those listeners who haven't come across your business. Would you like a classic elevator pitch? Fifteen. I'd seconds? love. I'd love a classic because I've got money. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to buy one, because... one one piece of your clothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, my brother and I a few years ago looked around, and in in every industry, we could see someone building the future. You had Noma in food, you had Tesla in cars, you had Apple in technology, and we took one look at clothing and couldn't put a name to it. So very naively or very cleverly, we decided we'd be the people who did that. And ever since, for the last five years, actually, a week ago, um, we've been making clothes from the future. It's what, our, it's what we call them. It's, it's, a, it's a, a neat way of trying to describe what we actually do, because if you start naming the materials, it's just so surprising to people. We make jackets out of copper and graphene. We make t-shirts out of plants and algae and ceramics and carbon fiber. And we take materials that have traditionally been used in entirely different industries and put them into clothing in really new and unique ways and bring properties to clothing that no one's ever thought about before. So that was our, that was our tilt at the future. And that's our element. But you, you, but you had no background in, in uh, clothing, did you? Absolutely zero, which I think is both shows the stunning naivety, but was also an incredible blessing because the, the good way of looking at it is we approach every problem with a beginner's mind. And mm. the bad way of looking at it is we're so stupid, we don't know what trap we're about to fall into <laughs> next. And it's always, it's always a joy to work out which one it's going to be. And as we evolve... We tend to do a bit more of the first one. So it tends to be a bit more kind of, okay, this is going to be cool. Whereas when we were first starting out, there were, there were many moments where we thought, what on earth have we bitten off here? We always think about, um, you know, that silly little phrase of like biting off more than you can chew. And it's, sometimes it's like ru running after a woolly mammoth trying to chew on its leg. And um, I think if I'd known that, I might not have started it. But um, I think it's what, it's what makes it so fun. I've got to ask you right up front, what was the biggest mistake you made up at the beginning? Um, we can, I'm more than happy to chat about it. And we, we, we have done before, which is we made a, we decided that we should be talking to a really unique group of adventure athletes. And the thing, uh, I mean, talking like super hardcore people who like climb mountains and surf big waves and do all sorts of treacherous things. We decided the thing they needed more than anything else on earth was a pink hoodie that zipped up over their faces. And if we, if we had taken the time or the trouble or the money to go to a focus group, every focus group on earth would have told you this is just the worst idea on earth. But what's so fascinating is what looked like the biggest mistake we could possibly make and could have killed us on conception. The idea, of course, was so committed to this idea of um, a hoodie that could help you relax that we went into deep amounts of research on color theory and body positioning and sound. And, you know, this, it was a very specific type of pink that various scientific researchers had showed to relax people in prisons, although how relaxed people could be in prisons. <laughs> right. um, and we combined that with a pink noise soundtrack, which is basically the nice version of white noise. We had body positions, you know, you, you, it encouraged you to breathe through your nose. And it was so committed to such an extreme idea that um, one of our fans, unbeknownst to us, was the comedian John Glazer, the, the guy, one of the guys from Parks and Recreation. And, and he, his, he's mates with Jimmy Fallon, and he took it onto the Jimmy Fallon Tonight Show. 
and we've never really looked back since. Mm. And I, we always we always reference that moment because it's so critical. Because essentially, an idea that looked completely stupid suddenly became genius overnight. But the idea hadn't changed. The idea was exactly the same. All that it had done is it had reached a critical mass of exposure for enough of the right people to find out about it and go, oh, I'm into that, which gave us enough capital to carry on with um, maybe slightly less silly ideas, maybe more silly ideas. It's difficult to tell. So you called your company Volaback. What does that refer to? It is, well, it, it encourages lots of arguments amongst Dutch and German people each of whom claim it means different things depending on which part of uh, the Netherlands or Germany they're from. Uh, our original intention for it um, is all out. In other words, foot to the floor, full gas, go for it. And we, mm -hmm. we found it um, in a, a cycling book referenced a, a, a term that's very occasionally used in the peloton. So like in the mm -hmm. Tour de France and places like that. And what it did at the time um, for us was summed up an attitude that we thought was really interesting. We actually... I picked that word a long time before I had any idea what the company was going to be about. And at the time I was a huge full of fan of Red Bull. They'd just done Stratos. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting that in one word, and a kind of curious, spiky, weird, sciencey sounding word, they had attempted they had effectively captured a spirit. Because all out in English is a very weak phrase. It sounds right. like a McDonald's end line or something. Um, but actually once you once you say it in a sort of like this uh, lost Flemish dialect, I believe it is, it kind of sounds interesting and a bit weird. So that, that's where it's from originally. And it, it summed up an attitude that interestingly has gone on to inform everything the company is about. Cause we, we don't really do half measures. We mm. kind of really go for it. And I, I suppose it does capture that, even if it's perhaps not the word I'd pick today, whether, whether a brand should start with a V and end with a K, I'm just not sure. <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, before you, we, we, we dive into some of these topics that we'd love, love to talk to you about, we should also um, just flag some of the incredible success you've had in such a short time um, in terms of awards and accolades and interesting customers and so on. Could you just talk us through some of the things that have happened in the very short time since you set the business up? You want the arrogant version, not the humble version? Is well, I'd like the, yeah, I like the arrogant version of the pitch, yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose one of the most exciting things for us is, um, well, rec recognition is always really important. Um, specifically when it when it's um when it compares you to other companies so i think one of my favorite things actually is um a squire a couple of years ago before we'd actually really really broken through um the editor there johnny compared us to a combination between l bully and tesla which i think was really really exciting for us however that isn't an accolade that's just a really nice quote um in the last three years we've been named times best invent uh, best 100 inventions twice uh, the first time for our solar charge jacket, which is uh, a jacket that can store and redistribute light, um, which is quite novel. So effectively, you can write all over it with your iPhone torch or it can store sunshine and glow through the night. And then we just got given the same award this year for um, our jacket called the Full Metal Jacket, um, which is made out of 65% copper. So every jacket has a, is woven with 11 kilometers of copper. And the reason this was so particularly important for us was essentially it paves the way for both intelligent and disease resistant clothing. Um, copper is an incredibly unique rooted material in that um, bacteria effectively cannot grow on it and will die um, when it comes into contact with the surface. And at the same time, as you look towards the future of intelligent clothing, any, any delivery system of intelligent clothing is going to need conductive material. It just is. There's no, there's no, no real other way to do it. And so copper and graphene are central to that. So um, we were lucky enough to get to win um, Time 100 Best Inventions for the second time for that. Um, so some of the other things we have pioneered, which have been particularly interesting, was we made the world's first jacket using graphene. So graphene mm -hmm. was... Uh, it's not a Nobel winning prize material, but certainly the guys who discovered it won Nobel prizes for discovering it. And uh, we've done some particularly interesting things with that. We created a, not only was the first jacket built with graphene, but it was a reversible graphene jacket. So effectively it was a science experiment. One side was, co was coated in graphene nanoparticles and the other side wasn't. And we asked our customers very kindly um, if they'd give us quite a lot of money and then go and be guinea pigs. Um, and it led to some really it was some, some really incredible moments. Um, one customer's life was certainly saved in it in the mountains of Nepal when he got lost uh, in a snowstorm late at night and with 30 minutes of sunshine left, effectively used his jacket as a solar sail to capture the last rays of sunlight, put it wow. on all, underneath all of his other clothes. And this is a, 
this is a former special forces dude. So not, not, not the type of people who mess around. Um, and then another one of our customers, uh, uh, an American research scientist was out in the Gobi desert, um, during a desert campfire ban. Sometimes they ban campfires in the Gobi desert was super cold, uh, had a camel with him. And so tied the graphene side of his jacket around the belly of the camel and the graphene jacket over the next 10 minutes absorbed the heat from the camel, but not the smell. And our, our friend customer put the jacket back on and stayed warm through the night because graphene effectively has this ability to um, uh, store uh, an infinite amount of heat, unlike any other material on earth, and then distribute it over time. So mm. those are some of the things we're proud, proudest of, I suppose. We've done lots of fun things in amongst that. We've built... Um, we built a jacket for prehistoric man. We've built jackets for space travel. <laughs> We've kind of gone forward and back in time to see, you know, what kind of inventions we think need our work. So the awards are nice. And we're very grateful when we get things like that. And you're, you're held up against some really great companies who definitely have more cash and more employees than we have. Um, but I think what's most rewarding, actually, as I sort of work through the answer to this question is when customers come back to you with stories about what it's meant to them. That's the, that's the truly profound thing, because ultimately uh, an award, whilst lovely, is some people in a room deciding if they think what you've done is good. But if you make gear for adventure, what, you, what actually matters is someone's gone out and done an adventure and this is what's happened with the gear. And that's actually the most exciting thing for us from an innovation perspective, because otherwise it's just theory. And theory is great, but it's nice to know you've saved a guy's life and he sends you this profound and long email. <laughs> That's really cool too. So you, you, you and your brother, Nick, your twin brother, um, as we talked about, came from a completely different industry. You were both successful advertising executives. What, what you know, took you on the path of wanting to get out of that industry and, and do something completely different? Well, I think probably the first thing was someone calling me an executive. I think that was so terrifying, that your, your quote there. <laughs> so, <laughs> essentially, we were in an industry where you could be called words like an executive, which is um, a profound insult to me. Um, it was, look, advertising is a fantastic industry because it teaches you to have a radical discipline with ideas because the starting principle of everything is no one wants to listen to you. No one cares. You've got nothing interesting to say. And your, your job is then win the attention and the trust of someone who doesn't want to listen to you. And it's such a profoundly hard brief. And it really doesn't matter if you're working on Nike or Apple or Butter. It's the same brief. You're basically going to interrupt someone in some way while they're doing something else. And so as a training in ideas, it's wonderful. And I suppose the other, the other, the other amazing training it gives you is don't be too precious with your ideas because they're going to die 99.999 percent of them are going to die there's a there was a wonderful experience i had from a, a guy who's now a very good friend but he was my first boss and quite terrifying as my first boss 20 years ago and i started off in advertising as a very junior account manager uh, along with five other junior account managers and we all went in our smart suits one day trembling knowing absolutely nothing about the industry and he handed us all um a an airfix model kit and you know these things like 999 and it's like you build a little world war ii plane or whatever and he said to us like i want you to take this away and i want you to spend two days in your house coming up with something using this kit but it can't be the plane it's got to be something else it's got to be really really imaginative don't even come to the office during those two days go away and invent us something wonderful and we all trooped in like two days time thinking wow he's going to realize i'm a creative genius look what i've done with my airfix kit and he arranged them really carefully on the floor in front of him and looked over them and was like wow absolutely wonderful and then one by one he stamped on them as hard as he could <laughs> and he said when you come in and kill a creative's ideas this is how it feels so please kill them carefully now fuck off out of my office <laughs> And it was the most wonderful example of, okay, let's not be too precious with ideas. This is what's going to happen to them. So it's a very long way round of saying advertising teaches you not to connect your ego to the idea that you've come up with. Cause if you do, you're going to get crushed on a daily basis. So as a profound training mechanism for how to start your own brand, it really is incredible because starting a brand, you are going to get crushed on a daily basis, but I've already done that for 15 years. So it's okay. So it's nothing new. So, there's no point going into the politics because like every industry, <laughs> advertising has plenty and there's lots of people who are waiting to stab you in the back as soon as you turn around. But I think the, the way I look back at it now is this profound training ground for ideas. 
not being too precious about them, but making something that someone cares about. And we spent a really happy and unhappy 15 years doing it. And by the end, we were creative directing some really big brands like Adidas and Airbnb and getting to do some incredible stuff. We floated a, a, a real house down the River Thames with a dog kennel and a, a little... Um, a little platform for birds to eat seeds and it kind of went down the river Thames and it was for, for Airbnb when they were um, launching again in the UK. And it was just wonderful. It was like a little Pixar movie. I mean, so we got to do some incredible things. And I think probably they wouldn't thank me for saying it now is you, you get to experiment with other people's money. So when you get to start a brand, you've already spent, you know, 2 million on this thing or 250 grand or whatever you've, you've learned what happens when you burn people's money and how much it matters. And I think, so those are probably the lessons I learned. So how do you keep such an open, empowered, positive mindset in, in the face of ideas failing? And, and how do you, what tips would you give somebody that, that might feel more discouraged? You, you seem to thrive on the, on the whole experience. Like what mindset do you have to adopt? Um, I suppose my mindset is quite different. I mean, I have a set of techniques, which I go into afterwards, but my mindset is um, this really bizarre one that I've, I've told some people about, but not many of, um, essentially complete detachment. So I have this thing I do with my son, who's only 10 now, and I tell him that he's my favorite collection of eight octillion carbon atoms. And <laughs> not, not because I'm heartless, but because the way I think of- Is that the way his I, birthday I, card? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, same one. Um, but what, what's funny about it is I, I really try and get out of the way of the idea. So as I said, I really try to separate the fact that I exist and I have an ego with the idea that is coming out of my mind. I have to completely separate myself from those two mm. things. It sounds very artificial and weird, and it's taken me years to do it. And honestly, it took me years of you know, having my ideas killed and caring so deeply that I realized that actually that was going to really hold me back. The more I cared about the idea, interestingly, the more defensive I, came, I, I became about it, and the more I'd fiercely tried to protect it without having the critical assessment of, well, someone's walked in and they said my idea is not good. And what you really should do then is, well, maybe my idea isn't any good. Um, but what from a very young age, most people are not trained out of is this very defensive mindset. You know, my picture's good, isn't it, mummy? Look what I've written, daddy. Mm. And a lot of people still carry that when they're 40 or 50 years old. And I found that it's an incredibly unhelpful thing. So I try and completely detach myself. So once the idea is left, it's just out there in the world and I can feel pretty neutral about it. I got taught this by uh, a, a good Spanish creative director friend of mine when I was very young at an agency. And he had this incredible idea, which was every day he gave away his best idea to a junior team in the advertising agency. And he just gave it to them and he just slip it onto the desk and they'd have it. And his idea was it just forced him to become less precious and it forced him to come up with more ideas. And it was the most mind blowing thing I'd ever seen because I was 22 and I was struggling to even come up with one idea. So the idea of this guy walking around giving ideas away for free. So we, we were lucky enough to have quite a few creative mentors when we were younger who kind of showed us this level of de detachment very early on, probably because they'd had their own brutal experiences in advertising. But the, the eight octillion atoms is a kind of, it's a way of me thinking about that very structurally which is this loose collection of this number of atoms is going to be held together for about 80 years what, what do you want to do in those 80 years and it, it, it is what you want to do fighting about an idea that someone thinks is crap and you think is great or do you just want to come up with an idea that everyone thinks is great and so it forces you to kill very very quickly stuff that isn't well received mm, that's so you you've, you've created the freedom now with your business to be able to spend more time doing that um, what's it like when you step back in and you can maybe bring some of the techniques in that you've learned to, to encourage this? What, what was it like when you step into, back into corporate life? Because I, I guess you're, you're, you're so, such an exciting company. People like uh, Google and others are wanting to talk to you. What's it like when you're, you're trying to work collaboratively with that old corporate environment that you've come out of? Well, it's very funny. We, we, I always had this plan that we would resist collaborating for as long as possible because ultimately I came in with a very specific idea around collaborations which is the weakest brand loses that's the reality and so I was very sure that I wanted to have us, us to have a very very specific identity and be able to stand on our own two feet before we approached any kind of relationship with anyone from the outside um, 
interesting I do now feel with the the run of success we've had and uh, there's a number of kind of world firsts under our belt that kind of whether people have heard of us or not and most people haven't um from a clothing perspective we have started to do some quite interesting things um having held off um any collaborations we are now in the process of talking to some some of the world's leading people in their industries which is absolutely fascinating but as you say what is so fascinating about it is the reminder of the world I left which is it, it, you get these incredible instructions like run this marathon as fast as possible while juggling and that's what every meeting feels like because the, there are so many inherent contradictions so the, the key thing for me is I suppose we've been so privileged because we've been able to build our company up from day one around this idea of innovation. So because we've been able to structure the company exactly as we wanted, and I spent 15 years in an industry watching effectively innovation be stifled for the most part, um, we've been able to build all of these structures that get rid of all of the stuff that stops innovation happening, you know, committees and groups and meetings that have to happen for two hours, but there's no conclusions at the end of them. So it has been... um, it's both been both a blessing and a curse sort of looking back into that world. And we we will take a very, very gentle footstep into it is my answer because I'm not racing to go back there. Now there are definitely some companies and some groups that can help us advance at a more rapid speed than we can do on our own. So I'm not going to pretend for a minute that we have technological capabilities to outsmart Apple or Google or NASA or SpaceX or any of these companies. So we, we, you do actually have to look around and go, okay, who are the partners that could accelerate us best? But at the same time, as you take very careful footsteps into those, you have to, I look for all the watch out signs that we had back in advertising, which is, okay, how political is it? How many meetings are we going to have to go through to even come up with an idea? So it's a very gentle and tentative process. So that's how I approach it very, very carefully and very thankful of what we've built because it's just a reminder of what we've escaped. If you're enjoying The Evolving Leader, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. And don't forget to follow along on Instagram and LinkedIn. You can find us at Evolving Leader. Thank you for listening. Now, let's get back to the show. You talk a lot about um, radical candor being needed in organizations. Um, And John tells me you you come up with uh, something that you call truth bombs. What is a... a, uh, Truth bomb. Lay, lay a truth bomb on me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can talk about your beard if you like. Yeah, I was going to say, this, this beard is a really obvious one. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's my COVID, COVID um, look. Yeah. There, was a, there was a wonderful uh, little series. Um, I, I, I think a very frustrated advertising creative must have made it, and it was a little video series. Just before YouTube had really kicked off, actually, I think you had to watch it on something called Contraband, which is pre-YouTube, and it was just called The Truth in Advertising. And someone made a series of maybe 10 minute films and it was just everyone saying exactly what they thought in every advertising meeting, but saying it with the exact tone that they normally would, which is, Judith, thank you so much for your comment. You're a bitch and I hate you. (laughs) And one of the things that was so ironic about spending so long in advertising is just no one tells the truth. If the client thinks it's rubbish, they very rarely go, this is rubbish. If the ad agency has not had enough time to work on it, they never say they've not had enough time to work on it. They pretend they have. And it's just this giant, giant pretense. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, really, it's a really interesting concept. It's very hard to lay a truth bomb on someone who's never met me because you just come across as extremely rude. Um, but one of the things we try to do in our company is just make sure that everyone tells the truth all the time. One of the extremely interesting things when you do run a company is just how many mistakes you make. I mean, it's just so many all the time, but everyone who works for you has this perception that they've inherited from other companies that, you know, make enough mistakes and you're going to be fired. And so one of the incredible ironies about running a company is you're going to make more mistakes probably than all of your employees combined, but you're not going to be fired. So one of the things I try to do all the time is the minute I make a mistake, I tell everyone about it because they have to know and you have to be able to react. So one of the, one of the ways in which I think my job is interesting, I, I can't remember, I read this quote the other day, but it's wonderful. And they said the CEO's job is to find the biggest stone they can, a stone being a practice in the business, and lift the stone up and look at all the dark, horrible, squiggly things underneath it and shine a light on those things. And so we very routinely do that. And I practice that. And 
So yes, for some, for some employees, it can be uncomfortable because I will highlight a process that I think is wrong and I'll tell everyone about it immediately. I absolutely hate this idea of um, closed doors and the idea that someone knows something and someone doesn't. You kind of want to get everything out in the open, especially with such a small company. Now, I, 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 know, there are, I know there are specific companies that try to practice this with 1,000 people and 10,000 people. And it gets much harder because like, what does everyone know? Everyone's salary? <laughs> you know? and right. it, it, it gets incredibly hard, but certainly in terms of what is happening in the company, what's going wrong and what's going right. I just tell everybody everything all the time because mm. otherwise people are left with part information. They're left guessing and they're going to guess wrong and then they're gonna, their actions are going to be the result of guessing. So the thing I've struggled with, of course, is as we grow, the amount of simply the amount of time I have this to do this and communicate with everyone is much harder. When you're all around a, effectively a kitchen table, it's very easy. Everyone knows everything. And then as soon as, you know, COVID happens and you're split up over email and there's, you know, more than five of you, <laughs> it's incredibly hard. So the, the truth bombs are less horrible than you might imagine. It's just forcing yourself to confront brutal reality as often as possible. And I, it definitely comes from our, our experiences in sport where you can't shy away from that. You, you talk um, about how the, the mental architecture that you've come to understand and build is directly proportional with your ability to innovate and be creative. Can you talk a little bit about you know, how you've come to see that? Um, yeah, so I think my... Um, Mental architecture is probably influenced very, very strongly by the races that my brother, who I run the company with my twin brother, um, some of the races we went through, we used to race sort of some quite extreme ultra marathons and adventure races. And um, as a result of racing these and also training for these, I um, had two very near death experiences. Uh, so one I had 30 seconds to go and was literally in the white tunnel that people talk about and, you know, sound had gone and everything was black and white. Um, I was basically being, I was basically being swept out to sea and couldn't save myself. I was eventually saved by someone else. Um, and the other one was during a race in Namibia where my heating system shut down and it was a uh, 130, 140 degrees. Uh, but my body thought it was incredibly cold. So my teeth were chattering. I had goosebumps and it was doing everything it could to warm me up. And so this sounds completely unconnected to business, obviously, but the reality is um, once you've been through experiences like this, and I've got lots of you know, friends who are sort of soldiers and have gone through similar things, it just completely resets your mind because you just perceive risk in an entirely different way. And so business is essentially a series of risks and a series of threats, and everything is on, on one of those spectrums and on a scale. And once you've been through experiences where you go, oh, hey, this is, uh, I've been, one of those near-death experiences was particularly profound for me, um, the one where I was uh, going out to sea too quickly and going under, um, because I still remember the internal monologue of my head, which is like, oh, hey, this is interesting. <laughs> this is how it's going to end. Wow. And that was literally the only thoughts in my head. And I could still, I can still see my dad and my brother on the beach as I got swept out. I was like, and I was like mid twenties at this point. I'm not a child. I just got caught in a, a crazy, crazy rip um, in between Spain and Africa. And I still remember the neutrality of the internal monologue going, Hey, that's weird. I didn't think I'd go down still holding my t-shirt. <laughs> this is really odd. And what that's done is it's just completely rebuilt the mental architecture around risk. And essentially the way I look at it is, yeah, as I say, business is just like a series of threats and a series of opportunities. And so once your mind gets recalibrated, you're far freer to go, is this thing I'm facing actually a risk or not? Like, you know, am I going to lose my life over it? Well, almost never in business. Am I going to lose the business? Possibly. Is the business my life? No. <laughs> so you, can, you do these incredibly kind of um, almost psychopathic maths exercises in a way that I suspect if... I, I, lots of other people I chat to aren't able to have this sense of disconnection. And so I think the thing I carry is the ability to remember that sense of, sense of disconnection and reapply it to experiences I'm having now. Yeah. Now, that's not to say I don't get nervous or anxious about stuff. I still do. But, I, you know, within, with enough kind of, you know, bit of meditation, a bit of sport, I can kind of recalibrate that in my mind and make some quite bold calls that perhaps other people wouldn't be able to make based on 
nearly dying in a desert and at sea, which is super strange. I, I, wouldn't, I don't think any management books have written about this and said, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> before you start a company, have you considered nearly dying? It might be good for you. Um, but there's definitely, a, there's definitely a recalibration of everything that happens afterwards. The, the way that you described it to me when we talked about it before is that you have this kind of like much clearer emotional spectrum that you can see things on. So the register around this is much, much higher and, uh, and, and, and uh, broader than most people because of those experiences. So when you see risk, right. it, it feels different. It's in context with that spectrum. So you're, you're not reacting to it in the way that somebody who hasn't got that spectrum might, might Correct. do. Yeah. Correct. So if you think about um, where I was previous to these experiences, let's say I had a spectrum of one to 10 and 10 is like, oh, you know, my goodness, I'm going to walk in today and be fired. It's a 10. Yeah. And then what this does really interestingly is it just increases the range of your spectrum. So you can suddenly see 10 to 100. So walking into, let's say you walk back into your advertising job and, hey, you're going to be fired today. It's still a 10, but you've experienced what 100 feels like. So it's like, huh, it registers, yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't register in the way it did. So what it, do, it doesn't suppress everything else. It just lets you know there's a place that exists that's far beyond everything, anything I could have possibly have comprehended before. Um, so it's not, yes, yeah, so that, that's the interesting thing. So it is a spectrum increase versus so that the the tens are still tens you just know what a hundred feels like and wow a <laughs> hundred feels very very different to the ten yeah how might somebody get that perspective without having to nearly die like how would a leader get that perspective do you have any thoughts about that if they are physically able i could not possibly recommend enough moving in any way cycling swimming running until they can't because one of the fundamental things that I was able to experience, even, even ignoring the near-death experiences, let's take them away for a second, is the series of imaginary hurdles that your brain puts in your body's way. So everyone's heard of the wall, right? And everyone who's run a marathon goes, hey, when did you hit the wall? Mile 16 or mile 22? Now, what you don't hear a lot of talk about unless you read you know, the ultramarathon blogs or go and run one is you will run into wall after wall after wall during the course of even, let's say, let's say a 24 hour race, you might experience five or six walls and each wall will be defined by, wow, I simply can't move my legs anymore. Or your brain going, stop, 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 stop. Or you're physically throwing up or you feel so drained of energy, you feel like you might die. But as long as you carry on, what happens is like an hour later, you feel all right. <laughs> and you realize that your brain has put all sorts of imaginary barriers in front of you in order to stop you dying. It's a protection mechanism. And once you've gone through that, and as I say, so even if you aren't like a super athlete, most people should be able to go for a 20 hour walk and experience the idea that when it's at its hardest and everything's saying stop, you actually don't have to. You do have the ability to go through that. And I think I don't think you need to run for 24 hours to do that. I don't think you need, need to die in a desert. I think you could literally do something physical that you simply haven't possibly anticipated ever doing before and do it for long enough to realize that the, there is, it's, it, it's not Keanu Reeves in the matrix, but there is a thing there where you go, oh, wow, reality's not quite as real as I thought it was. And all the things that are telling me to stop actually might not be real. And as soon as you real, realize that you're, brain is almost this separate protective entity it opens you up to realizing well maybe not all of my intuition is true maybe not all of my gut instinct is correct maybe actually i do have this inner source of strength that is far deeper than i could possibly imagine maybe i can tolerate more pain maybe i can tolerate more risk um uh, and that's the, that's the thing that I would encourage anyone to do. Now, obviously, it's going to be uncomfortable and <laughs> you're going to hurt a bit. But so what? <laughs> we used to be cavemen. <laughs> we weren't born to sit on seats and look at computers. So I think it's, it, it, it's the thing genuinely I recommend to anyone who asks me anything. I was like, go, uh, until you go do, you know, go, go do something for 24 hours that's physically very hard, I don't know how well you can actually know yourself. Because, mm. yeah. That's really interesting. How do you know when an idea is, is interesting? Two things happen. One, I laugh or my brother laughs, or we tell our children and they understand it. That's it. It's so, so simple. We've reduced it down over the years of, is it, is it funny? 
will, will someone I love or like or respect go, ha, that's funny. That's it. <laughs> that's kind of like, it's kind of as simple as it is. And Einstein, I think it is, had this wonderful quote, which is, if you can't explain your idea to a 10 year old, you don't understand your idea. And I, I think it's just absolutely fundamentally true. Um, and you can do it for the most complex pieces of technology. I mean, you know, the, the, the iPod was a technological marvel, but it resulted in Steve Jobs going a thousand songs in your pocket. Now, anybody can understand that. You can be five or 50 or 100 and you can still understand that. So the, the really key things are laughter and children, which I know sounds absolutely banal. But let's look at the world's best restaurant for a second, the Noma and Rennie Red Zeppi. And one of my favorite dishes where you come in and you have to cook your own egg. <laughs> now, that's so silly. Like the reason I'm coming to you is you're a really good chef. I, I would expect you to cook my egg for me. <laughs> but the world's best restaurant can go, no, you're going to cook your own egg today. Um, or let's use Heston Blumenthal and bacon and egg ice cream. I could explain that to my five-year-old. They know that ice cream shouldn't taste of bacon and eggs. Um, or let's use um, the Cybertruck, Tesla any 11 year old can go wow <laughs> now there's a, there's a huge amount of design and engineering complexity gone into there but at the end of the day there is a small child going wow i want to be a big boy and drive that so we look for really radical simple things in ideas which is can almost anybody understand it uh, and it absolutely goes back to our advertising days of like we tended to think if we couldn't do our idea in two words we probably didn't have an idea so the Airbnb sort of house that I talked about before was called Floating House. <laughs> it's like, okay, cool. It's a house that floats. We did uh, an idea for Adidas that won what, lots and lots of awards when we were back in advertising, which was lovely at the time. Um, and it was for some basketball shoes being made by Adidas and uh, one of their star players at the time, Derek Rose. And we made a pop-up shop and it was full with these basketball shoes and they were all free, but they were on a 10 foot high shelf. And that was it. <laughs> and if you, if you could dunk and get the shoes, the shoes were yours. And if you couldn't, they weren't. And so we, we reached this point where our ideas had to be done in two words. And we've, we've kept that today, interestingly. So we occasionally stretch it like solar charge jacket. But, you know, indestructible puffer, 100-year pants, full metal jacket, all of our things are very, very descriptive of the thing they do where – anyone, no matter their sort of education, age or training in whatever discipline, should be able to understand what we've got. And so that, that's, the, that's the way we operate in terms of ideas because it, it reduces it down away from subjectivity and, oh, this person thinks it's good and this person doesn't. You've got to be able to understand it really quickly. Do you have a favorite idea that you came up with? I was looking through all your, your clothing and it's all amazing, but is there something that you're like, this is my most proudest, most proud achievement? <laughs> Well, there's a, there's a distinction between what I'm really proud of and what I'd wear. I'm hilariously like just really unfashionable. I mean, I'm sitting here in my cycling gear from earlier. <laughs> I, there's rarely a day goes by where I actually look in the mirror and go, I wonder what I'm wearing today. Um, in terms of what we're proud of, um, I think two of the most interesting things we've ever worked on are um we did them in a space of a couple of months of each other actually one was called the Fifty Thousand bc jacket which was a jacket designed for prehistoric man and i'll go into that in a minute and we followed that up with a deep sleep cocoon which is a jacket designed for space travel and going back to the restaurant analogy i used earlier one of um one of our heroes is heston blumenthal the famous british chef who owns the fat duck at bray and one of the things we'd watched him do and been quite jealous of sort of 10 years 10 years ago was watch him flit between the past and the future and experiment with doing food that was from Alice in Wonderland. And then he'd do something that looked like it was from 20 years in the future in Japan. And we thought, isn't that wonderful that he can just jump between time zones? And we thought, oh, I wonder if we could do that in clothing. I wonder if anyone's done that before. And we just went and had a crack at it. And so our, the brief we set ourselves um, originally was, well, what would prehistoric man like to have worn? And we came up with this idea of effectively a, a, a portable shelter um, made out of waterproof wool with this giant triangular hood that keeps this warm pocket of air around your head. And it's half tent 
half cave, half jacket, and it's super crazy. <laughs> and then, and then we jumped really far into the future to look at what the, the fundamental issues were going to be with space travel and what one of the fundamental issues, and some astronauts experience this and some don't, m- m- but most do, um, is, is the ability to sleep regularly. Because what happens is we're still, you know, nocturnal creatures. We, we like to sleep when the sun goes down. Um, but even on the ISS, you have um, 17 sunsets and sunrises a day. So we started to tackle sleep because most astronauts take sleeping pills. And then you've got really highly trained people on a thing worth hundreds of millions of dollars floating above the Earth's atmosphere, not necessarily operating at optimum. So we're like, okay, well, let's have a look at sleep. Um, and we designed something called a deep sleep cocoon. And the only way of really thinking about this as podcasts aren't visual is if you crossed a space helmet with a woodlouse you would end up with a deep sleep cocoon so it's a a sectioned black hood that effectively folds up over your head to create a circular micro environment around your face where you can see out but no one could see in it's dark it's warm it's comforting and those two pieces for me are just a, a real symbol that we absolutely don't start with commercial aims. Because I can tell you, there's no astronauts waiting to buy <laughs> jackets for the first trip to Mars. And there's no cavemen with any money, and they're certainly dead by now. And so what it was really a testament to was um, the idea that we'll go and explore any idea that's interesting. And again, I come back to like, but I, do, I, do, I do resent focus groups so much because um, advertising was ruled by focus groups. If you took either of those ideas to a focus group, I mean, <laughs> what, what do people say? <laughs> they go, there aren't any cavemen. <laughs> you can't buy a trip to Mars yet. So why are you making these clothes? Um, but what it was, was just symbolic of, symbolic for me that we'd basically go and have a crack at any idea that was interesting. And especially because no, one, no one's trying to tackle these things. And so... That's fundamentally one of the most interesting things about running the company is essentially we've, we've had clothes for 50,000 years and we've kind of only ever asked the same questions of them. Can I stay? And we, we were asking the same questions 5,000 years ago in the last, last ice age. We just had different materials. We had bark and grass and deer skin, which is, can I stay cold if I want to be cold? Can I stay warm? Can I stay dry? Can I show everyone that I'm the king or the pope or the important person? And that's kind of the only questions we've asked. It's like, well, technology and clothing are, are going to merge over the next 50,000 years, whether it's our company or another company. They're, they're going to merge. Every, everything on a long enough time spectrum is going to become a computer, essentially, whether we want it to be or not. Like, we, we are going that way. And all, all we're trying to do is ask different questions of clothing uh, and questions that have never been asked before that are, that are really far removed from, can I stay warm, dry, and cool? And it's like well, can it send me to sleep? Can it relax me? Can it become its own light source? Can it be buried in the ground when you're finished with it? Can it conduct electricity? Can it stop diseases penetrating your immune system? And as soon as you start asking really interesting questions of clothing versus can I make a $200 red jacket, you're going to get more interesting answers. I have no idea what your question was originally, but... (laughs) (laughs) Neither do I, but I love the answer. (laughs) So... We've had an extraordinary year and you've come through it in great shape. What's next for Von and back? Well, the thing we're really, really interested in and always slightly surprised that more designers aren't looking at is we're at possibly one of the most unique turning points in human history, which is for the first time, we're capable of destroying the planet we live on. And we're within 20 years of colonizing new planets. So we're either going to become a zero planetary species or a multi-planetary species. And one of our key jobs as designers is designing for those realities. Um, There's an amazing, uh, I think it's Einstein quote again, which is he said, I don't know what World War III will be fought with, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones which is a a, a really stunning summation that we assume that we're on this pure linear progression towards, you know, democracy and enlightenment and science winning and, you know, all of these things that as sort of, you know, liberal Westerners, we would assume are correct. Um, Completely ignoring that there have been multiple different civilizations with completely different ways of looking at the world. Um, 
the thing we fundamentally try to tackle is what are living conditions going to be like over the next century and where are they going to be? I, I find it extraordinary. And I understand the sort of like the commercial imperative that every sort of um, like clothes company will be rigorously focused on the next season. But for me, the next century is so profoundly interesting and it contains so many possibilities that we're directing all of our attention towards that because it is highly likely that if we're all alive in 20 or 30 years, there really will be people on Mars. They really will be setting up bases. We really are going to establish a civilization there. And at which point you go, what do we take up there? What thought process are we taking up there? What morality, what materials, what science, what creatures? And that is the most remarkable open-ended brief I've ever seen. <laughs> and so our thought is, well, let's start working on that now, because by the time we get there in 20, 30 years, I want to have spent 20, 30 years working on it. The last thing you want to do in the world is like, you know, SpaceX or Jeff Bezos or wherever it is eventually gets us to Mars. Um, and no one's designed any clothes for it. And we're wearing corduroy. <laughs> so we've got this fundamental ambition that when they do land, they're wearing our stuff. So in order to do that, I have to do some really stunningly interesting things now to make sure that we're part of that race. Um, and that might, might sound completely bizarre. And, you know, I don't have Elon Musk's phone number, but th these are things we're working on. As I say, next year, we will bring out some stuff that will be very, very surprising considering to date we've only been a clothing brand um, where it really starts to look at what are the things we need to truly consider if space is going to be a new habitat and the earth is going to potentially become unviable? And we've got ideas coming out that are miles away from clothing that start to look at those realities. Um, that's, that's what I'm working on now. Well, we, well we're going to watch with huge interest uh, mm. what comes next. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Steve, thank you so much for, for coming on. This has been a fascinating conversation. I'm going to be thinking about so many of the things you said uh, all weekend long. So thank you. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember, clothing is evolving. Are you?